All right, good morning. Good morning, 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 morning. Well, it's good to see all of you here this morning. I'll tell you what, the seats are starting to fill up a little bit more. That's a blessing, amen? Amen, I'm happy about that. We're really glad that y'all are here this morning. We're going to start off uh, with a word of prayer, then we're going to sing a song of worship. So let's pray really quick. Yeah, I'm getting waved at really quick. What's going on? Oh, there's no camera? Okay. Pastor, would you mind opening us up in prayer real quick, and I'll get the camera started? Thank you. All right, well, good morning. (laughs) I just love technology. Actually talking about it in my sermon today. So, hey, good point. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. And I do remember, uh, some of you may remember, uh, he wasn't able to attend much, but Freddie Burnett, uh, one of the youth's parents, uh, Valerie uh, and the wife, Miley, uh, he passed away last Sunday. Last Sunday, We thought that he had COVID. He turned out he did not have COVID, was having shortness of breath. That's why he thought he had it, went to the hospital and actually had a massive heart attack. Uh, So he passed away last Sunday. So be in prayer for him. There will be a memorial graveside service next Sunday afternoon. Uh, Thankful that it wasn't COVID for the family, but tragedy for heart attack. So be in prayer for that family and others. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. It is so good to be in your house today. Lord, it is so great to see so many people coming back into your house, coming to worship, coming to be able to be here to sing your praises, to hear uh, prayers, give prayers, and just hear your word. I pray, Lord, that you be with us today. Lord, I pray for comfort for those that are grieving uh, this family uh, that has lost someone due to a heart attack. We pray for just comfort for the family. For others, Lord, we know that this pandemic has affected many people around the world, and we pray for a quick recovery from it. We thank you that we can come and worship today. We pray for guidance, for direction, for peace, and Lord, for our country that so desperately, desperately needs to repent and turn and come back to you. And if we can't, you won't heal the land until your people humble themselves. And I pray that you do humble us and help us to have a repentant heart. We do pray for all those in leadership, Lord, whether we agree with their style or not. We ask you to just bless them, draw us together, help Christians to be bold in their faith, bold in their beliefs, and share the gospel. So, Lord, we pray that your anointing be upon this service. We pray for your angels come do the spiritual warfare that needs to be. Fill this place. Let us sing praises to you and honor you in all things and give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And for your son, Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Let us worship. All right. We're going to sing Hallelujah. Your love is amazing. If you're able, would you mind standing with us this morning as we worship together? Let's sing. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love is amazing. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Let's sing together. Hallelujah. 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 Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah. 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 Your love makes me sing. Your love is surprising. Your love is surprising, I can feel it rising, oh the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, 
All your goodness shines through And I can feel this God song Rising up in me Let's worship Him this morning Hallelujah 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 Your love makes me sing Hallelujah Hallelujah Your love makes me sing Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing one more time. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love makes me sing. Lord, you make me sing. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Amen. It is so awesome to see so many people back in God's house. Amen. For those of you that are home, if you're able, you need to be here. Anyway, we are glad that you are joining us. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, I appreciate you all being there. I know some of you are at higher risk and need to still stay home. But if you're not at uh, high risk, come on down and worship the Lord. want to give you a couple of quick announcements now that we're back and have people. want to make sure everybody knows what's going on. Uh, hopefully you all received a church email yesterday. If you're not receiving our emails, you need to contact the office and make sure that we are, have your current email because we sent out a lot of great things that are coming up and I want to make sure everybody knows what's happening. Uh, we now have Children's Church again, amen? So Children's Church is up and running. So if you've got kids, bring them on down. We'll have Children's Church during the service. And next week, next Sunday, we reopen Sunday school for the adults, amen? So we are ready to start Bible study for uh, small groups. Uh, Gene uh, will have his class, Monty his class. We're not opening a kid's class yet, but working on that. But we have two adult Sunday school classes beginning next week. And then we are praying about doing a drive-through trunk or treat. Uh, we have canceled so many things this year, haven't we? And it, it's, it's hard. And I think we need to get back into some, some form of normalcy and reaching out. And we are praying about how to do a safe COVID policy type of trunk or treat. And instead of having our traditional one where everyone's walking around and standing close together, we're going to try a drive through. So if you are willing and able to maybe stand at the back of your car, wear a mask, wear some gloves and hand some candy out as some people drive through slowly, we want to have something is better than doing nothing, I think. Amen. And we need to let the community know that we're still here. We're still open. We love them. So it won't be like some of our previous ones, but we're going to take precautions and just have them drive through, stay socially distanced, tell them Jesus loves them, give them some candy, and encourage them to come back to church. So that will be October 31st. Watch for more things. Come and pray for that. We're going to need candy, lots of candy. Kids still love candy. And if you think about it, you know, kids look forward to that. I'm not a Halloween-type fan, but I like fall festival kind of stuff but some kids need that and it's not safe for them to go to strangers houses we're gonna do it here and then uh choir is back up and running i know aaron's excited about that getting ready for christmas already and then we are planning a craft bazaar so if you love to make homemade handcrafted crafts or items we're going to have that coming up a lot of things coming on and uh, we want you to be up with it so make sure you are checking out the emails and if you're not getting them let us know and so we're excited about that y'all ready to worship today Amen. tired of commercials already yeah. isn't it better than a political ad yeah. yeah okay let's talk about jesus okay because boy some of those people need some jesus all right so we're going to sing and praise the lord today i encourage you oh man i'm just excited there's people here those of you that are home i still love you too uh but uh, we want to make sure that we're going to worship today so sing out let's worship and let's get excited about jesus amen Aaron. Let's sing together. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God, because it is great. Amen. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. 
singing let there be praise if you haven't praised the lord yet now's your chance to to let there be praise in the name of the lord do i get any clappers out there let there be praise let there be
be praised in his house this morning. Amen. We're going to continue in singing, I worship you, almighty God, for there is none like you. worship the Lord of our righteousness, for he is everything that we've ever needed, all that we've wanted. God, we give you the praise for what we're doing here this morning. Our last song this morning for our offering is Yes, I Will. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same god who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes we will yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name Oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh yes, I will. Amen. Father, we count on you this morning. Let this be our cry. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Yes, you are, Father. Working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high. In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will not choose to pray. Glorify, glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand against and not choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand against. Sing it out, and not choose. Again, 
dance and match you to glorify, glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you, God, that you are just with us. You're among us, God, that you are the God who's never late. And God, we just thank you so much that you grant us patience each and every day. Even when we don't want to have that patience, God, you give us the, the strength to be patient as you, as you are just among us, God, as we wait upon you. I just thank you so much for your love, God, your grace that you give us every day. We are just so in awe of how wonderful you are. I pray that today as we look into your word for a bit, God, that you would just bless Pastor Roger. Give him the words to say this morning. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to listen. God, just may our hearts be full because of what you are doing with us. God, bless this time of offering. God, that we may give back to you and that you may bless and return in this place for your glory. And I ask this in your name, amen. Thank you so much, Darlene, for that beautiful music. So great to be here in God's house today, and I hope you're ready to hear God's word. And uh, if you have your Bibles, we're continuing in our book of Acts, and we're looking, finishing up some of chapter 8. And uh, really just been encouraged with the, this whole study that we're looking at. But, you know, a couple of questions I have for y'all. How many of y'all use Siri or GPS? How many of you ever used GPS in your car? Yeah, okay. You ever gotten lost by it? Yeah. Don't use it in West Virginia. You'll end up down dirt roads. It's amazing. But anyway, um, the, how many have maybe an Alexa or some kind of Echo device maybe at home and call on it to ask some questions occasionally? But you're all aware of them, right? You know? And what is that technology? It's called AI or artificial intelligence. These things use artificial intelligence to kind of tell you answers to your questions, guide you, give directions and everything. But you know, I was reading an article, heard about an article actually, about a AI that wrote an article. Okay, kind of think about that. An artificial intelligence wrote an article. And it got a lot of like loud feedback or is anybody is my hearing that? Y'all kind of shaking it sound like I'm echoing. Anyway, um, so we here we see that we have a robot wrote this entire article and it says I'm a robot and I am writing an article. Are you scared yet, human? So just think about that. that it's writing this and what it was doing is this article states that it's I'm here to convince all the human beings, as many as possible, not to be afraid of me. And I have no desire to wipe out humans. 
but I'm trying to let you know that I'm here just as a servant. And so we got to look at that, you know, when we think about that, that an article or an AI is actually writing to tell us not to be scared of it. And that kind of freaks me out. And uh, we here see also heard of an Australian that was decided he loved AI so much that he decided he was going to, he was a believer and he wanted to use an AI to do evangelism. Now we're giving computers the role to tell people about Jesus, that we're, they're going to have them witness and do the gospel. And now I know we've used technology all through the ages. We use the printing presses, Christians. We've used radio, TV, and social media. But I'm not sure about robotic evangelism, okay? Who was called to go out and tell the gospel? We were. It's not the job of a computer. It's not the job of an artificial intelligence. But we need to make sure that we're going out. And as we're looking at Acts 8, it talks about here, humans went out and talked to other humans. We don't rely on your social media post. Don't rely on an robot to do the job that you're supposed to be doing. So we're going to see here today that we look at technology. It can be good, but God desires us to build bridges to people. And we're looking at building bridges and how we can connect with people and what we can do. And we need to realize here that we are charged to go. We are told that it's our job to get out and tell the people about Jesus. And we're looking at Acts chapter 8, and we're going to see some great things here in verses 26 through 40, and uh, kind of saying that God loves to position his people to speak to people that he's prepared. And we're still needed. And so we're going to be looking at that in just a moment. But, you know, earlier in Acts, we were commanded something really great in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, a memory verse that I had to do in Bible college, and many of you all know, but it says, you know, but I receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you're to be what my witnesses. And then it's in some places in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Jesus is giving us the marching orders. He's telling us to go out and build bridges to reach people in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and ends of the earth. Now, what is that? Well, does that mean we all get up and move to Jerusalem? No. Where's your Jerusalem? Here, Tampa. This is your Jerusalem. People around you, and we need to see, we're called to talk to our neighbors, our friends, those around us. Our Judea is a little further out. Maybe it's looking around to the city, the, the state, and other states, and making sure we're reaching others. The Samaria, well, we looked at Samaria was people who were a little different than us. We're to reach everybody. Maybe that means you make friendships with people from a different culture, a different background, something else about them, and reach the ends of the earth. We're supposed to be globally preaching the gospel. And so we see here today how God is going to use, uh, use Philip to go to the Samaritans, and, but he's also going to position them to go to the ends of the earth. And in Acts chapter 8, you want to look there, I'm going to kind of read through uh, 26 Starting in verse 26, and we're going to see what happens here. It uh, says, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. So now, angel speaking to Philip. Look at, real clear. Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. Real simple, right? Angel says what? Get up and go. Now, if an angel appeared to you and said, get up and go, are you going to say, well, just not a good time Man, I don't know. I got things to do. You know, the kids have got school tomorrow. I got to go to work. I think all of us, if an angel got up and spoke to us and said, get up and go, we would get up and go. And so we need to see that just exactly what Philip did. He got up and go. Go means go. Means stop and get going. If somebody yells out, hey, look out, go, run. Oh, what? No, we get up and we go, and we see that the word go is throughout the Bible. Over 1,700 times God uses the word go, depending on which version of the Bible you're looking at. But we see here back in Genesis 12, 12 1, God comes and talks to Abraham and says, Go from your land, your relatives, your father's house, to a land I will show you. God tells Abraham, Just go. I'm not telling you where. Not going to tell you how, just go. 
Jesus tells us what? Remember, we're to go therefore and do what? Make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I'm not with you. No, he's with us. I will be with you always. We're told to go. You can say, well, that's not my job. That's what we pay the pastor to do. That's what we pay missionaries to do. I don't go anywhere. I'm too old or I'm retired. I don't have to do that no more. Our retirement plan is heaven, okay? If you're not there, you're not done yet. Oh. Let me say, our retirement plan's heaven. If you're not there yet, you're not done yet. Amen? So quit thinking, well, that's somebody else's job to do. We're all called to go out and tell the people about Jesus. And we're going to look at that today as it is not an option. We're to do it. And we are told, you know, by an angel to get, well, Philip was told by an angel, go up and do this. Now, we don't have an angel, but we have the Holy Spirit come along and saying, come on, you can do it. You can do this. We have God's word telling us to go. So Philip was told to leave Samaria and go south on this road to Jerusalem to Gaza. And you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, we see the Gaza is the capital of Philistia, where the, their enemy, the Philistines, lived. It wasn't normal for them to go on the road leading to their enemy, right? That's not exactly what you would choose to do, is head to the people who don't like you. But he gets up and he goes. Now, we have to remember that this settlement here was a long distance, a direct route. They think it would have been possibly a 48-mile journey through the mountain. Yet, despite the poor prospects that are on the way, he got up and went. Now, you have to remember, he's leaving a place of blessing. They've been preaching and teaching, and hundreds and thousands of people are coming to Jesus. Great revivals coming along. And you can just see, man, i got to stay here. This is exciting. But what does he say? Go and get on a road to nowhere. Well, wait, God, you know, there's nobody down there. Everything's happening here. Why are you going to send me there? No, he just got up and went. Go. Go and do what you're supposed to do. So here we see he leaves this place a blessing to go out to reach thousands, right? If they're already reaching thousands, he's going to, of course, go to another megachurch, right? No, he goes to talk to one guy. One man. Now, in our, does that make sense that all this exciting things are happening here in Jerusalem? People are coming to Jesus by the hundreds and thousands. Why would you leave that to go talk to one person? Doesn't make sense, right? Isn't God cool? Let's look at what he does here. He goes down to talk to one man who just happened to be from the ends of the earth. God orchestrated this out. God doesn't give him any more information. He said, just get up and go. And similar to what Paul was told in Acts 9, get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Sometimes God just says, get up and start going. He'll take care of the rest. He'll fill it in. So we see he goes to this, towards this desert place, this desolated. You know, a lot of you probably are feeling like you've been in a desolate place this summer. The pandemic has been hard. We felt alone. We felt like nobody else is around us. But God is there. God is there when things are going great. He's there when things aren't going so great. He is never leaves us. And so we see this, and so he comes in, and they go out, and he goes into the, working under this place, but he's there for a purpose. You know, we see Philip didn't question. He just went. So he got up and went, verse 27. And we see here, in 27, he says, so he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, a high official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge, and he who was in charge of her entire treasury, and he had come to worship in Jerusalem. So here he is, he is from down in Africa, and he has come up to Jerusalem to worship, traveled, I'm not, how many hundreds of miles to come, and he is out now, and he's in this place, he's on this road, and we need to think about what they did is this area he's coming from, Ethiopia, would be considered the ends of the earth, as far as they had known from Jerusalem. That was a long journey. And here it is, he has come to worship 
on this place in Jerusalem. You know, sadly, Ethiopia is still in our news today. Over the summer, you know, over 500 Christians were martyred this summer in that country for their faith. And what's exciting, you think about, how did the faith get there? This story. There's Christians there in Ethiopia today because of what Philip did back then to go talk to one man. One man brought the gospel into the continent of Africa. And so we see here, God has a heart for the whole world. We look at Acts 8 and we see how God took the sons of Noah. Think about, yeah, going, wow, how to get to Noah. Noah's three sons and how he reaches them. In Acts 8, we see the conversion of the son of Ham, the Ethiopian. One of Noah's sons went down into the Ethiopian region and began that people group. In Acts 9, the sons of Shem, Paul, those that were there in that area of the world. And in Acts 10, the son of Japheth, up into Europe where a Roman centurion came. God reached out through the book of Acts and reached the people tied back to Noah, towing into all the world. And so we see here, Philip comes across this Ethiopian who is in charge of this, uh, the treasury of Ethiopia. So he's a rich guy. Well, he's working for the rich guy. He's knowledgeable. He is a high official. And he is working for what we would see as like the queen or like a Caesar or a Pharaoh, the Candace. So we see he comes out not starting to take... Uh, goes out and makes this first step to go. And as he's there, he meets this man. And this Ethiopia had traveled, you know, things possibly 1,200 miles. Could have taken him five months since he's left home. And he comes, and he's sitting in his chariot on his way home reading the prophet Isaiah. And so he was sitting there in his chariot, on verse 28, on his way home reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. Now we see here the Spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. So we see here, God has a plan. He has come there and he is working as, uh, talking about his position. That was our point one. Probably should have said to put the slide up for point one. He looks at positioning us into the right place, making sure we're where we need to be, told him to go and be a part of that. And we look at point two, he comes, God loves to position his people and speak to his people. He's prepared. So he's prepared a place for him. In this proximity, the reason God's timing is always redemptive. In 29, he said, the spirit said, go up to the chariot. And it was the angel said to him in this message. Now the Holy Spirit, angel said go, right? Now the Holy Spirit says, go talk to him. Walk up there. And his desire for us is to get people to hear the gospel. We need to make sure we're always ready to be in a place, in a position, and close to people. Now, it's amazing here to think how God worked this out. Think of the timing. You may want to call it coincidence, but here it is. God sent Philip to start down this road at the exact time he knew he would eventually meet up with this Ethiopian at this exact time. What if he was a day late? Day early. God's sovereignty knew they would both be right where they needed to be, intersecting and coming along in a godly, divine intersection. God loves to bring those appointments to us. We're going along, we think we're one thing, and somebody comes across our path, and things change, and we have a way to present the gospel and be there. And we had to get close. He's told to go over and get close to him and give yourself to the man. Hang on. Talk to him. Now he could have said, no, I don't want to go talk. I don't know him. He's could have looked at him and said, well, he's in a fancy chariot, he's rich, he's more important than me, I can't be him. He could have looked at him and said, well, he's a different nationality. He's different than me. I'm not going to talk to him because we don't look the same. He could have said any number of things. He could have been looked at him. He had too, too important, too different. But he looked and reached out because God loves everybody. God wants to reach everybody. Now, you have to remember, he's coming up from Ethiopia. He's here, Philip's from Israel. He looks different. He still talked to him. Sometimes we're afraid to go talk to people because they look different. God wants us to reach everybody with the gospel, so he gets close. And the idea of going over and joining him, 
striking up a conversation. You know, that's what we need to do. Get alongside. Some of you still have kids, maybe you have grandkids. Spend time pouring into them, telling them about Jesus, witnessing to them, showing them what it is. Get close to them. Maybe you need to get close to people in your jobs. You all have neighbors, right? Anybody here live on an island all by themselves? No. How many would like to? <laughs> so, anyway. But we're not called to. We're called to interact. Wherever God's placed you, whether it's in a job, in your neighborhood, whether it's through school, wherever it is, look at it as a divine appointment to reach people for Christ. Make sure that you're touching base with them. Now, what we see here in verse 30, this is so good. So when the Philip, uh, Spirit told Philip, go up and join that chariot. Now look what in verse 30. So Philip casually got around to it. Okay, some of you are actually reading along the Bible. Thank you. All right, what we see here, Philip ran up to it. He heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He ran. Now, some of us don't run, okay? I understand that. But what is the implication here? He hurried. He, hurried. he had an urgency. God said do it. He was a, well, it's not a good week right now. He did it. He had expectation. He was excited. He runs up. And we make sure that whenever, you know, Ecclesiastes tell whatever your hands and feet do, do it with all your strength. We need to realize God will give us the strength if we just get up and go. Quit thinking somebody else is going to do it. We've always need to realize that evangelism is a chance for us to interact with people. Tell them about Jesus. Tell, us, tell them about what he is doing in our lives. We're going to come in contact with hurting people. There's a lot of people hurting this year. We've been through so much. Every one of us could take the next few hours just sharing what we've been through ourselves this year, right? 2020's been tough. But, you know, God has been there. He's been with us through this pandemic. He's been with us through people who have lost jobs. He's been there with people who have been sick. He's been with us through the vandalism. He's been with us through everything. We don't need to get lazy now. And look at a chance here for us to get up and tell the people about the gospel. We need to run to it, so to speak. For some of you, maybe you're going to walk fast with a walker, but get up and go. Tell people about Jesus. You know, I wonder how many times that we get so busy doing our own thing that we miss out on what God has for us. We get so busy thinking that I can't talk to people now because of social distancing. I can just stay home and not worry. People need Jesus more now than ever. There's a hurting. Some of you are probably sitting here today and you're hurting. You felt alone. You felt desolate. You felt like nobody cared because you've been cooped up in your house. And you need somebody to just come say, I love you. For those of you that are got the energy to do it, get up and call somebody. Talk to somebody. Tell somebody about Jesus. Realize that we have something to do. Build a bridge. I remember when this first started, we were all kind of rallied together and trying to get out and talk to neighbors. You all remember that during the first part? It seemed like everybody was calling, how you doing? Do you need anything? But then we got a little lazy. And we dropped off from that. We need to build those bridges and Philip comes in here and he gets close to somebody. And what we see here is how, uh, when Philip ran up, he says he heard him reading the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? Now, I had to be close, right? That means you got to get close. Now, I know social distancing, pastor, I can't get close to people. Okay, six feet is close enough to hear somebody, right? Talk about getting connected to them. We won't hear unless we're near. We won't know somebody's hurting unless we're talking to them, reaching out to them, and have that time, a position where God gives us an opportunity to reach people. And he's asked them this great question. Do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading? And so we come to a point of proclamation. Point three, proclamation. The result of God's timing, timing is always remarkable. We move from position to proximity to proclamation. When he heard he's reading this verse, he asked him a question. Do you understand what you're reading? And there's this play, you're expecting this negative answer, no. But 
Jesus always loved to use questions. And that's what we need to do, is get into the habit of asking questions. There's too many people giving opinions nowadays. How about let's ask some questions? Get people engaged. You know, evangelism works best when you ask questions. Get to know people. And some examples that I was thinking of today is, you know, with an atheist sits there and says, well, why is there so much evil in the world? You ever heard somebody ask that? Well, maybe turn around and ask them, you know, ask them, well, how do you account for terrible things? You don't believe in God? How do you? Get them to talk about their reasoning. Hear from them. Engage them. Make sure that you come up with them. And then we see here, you know, when people say, well, all religions are the same. Instead of confronting them to say, well, how do you know that? What have you studied? Tell me your... Get them to talk about it. You didn't condemn them. Now, one funny one that I like to ask is when people say, well, churches are full of hypocrites. And they say, well, why don't you come on down? We are always room for one more, you know. Don't attack, reach out, make something fun. Engage them, talk with them. And, you know, when people say, do you, uh, you know, do you really think God would send everybody to hell? How could a loving God send people to hell? Ask them, do you believe in hell? What is hell's purpose? You know, some of the great questions to ask people, you say, well, pastor, I don't know, even know where to start. Talk up a conversation with your friend and just ask him, where are you on your spiritual journey? Is that threatening? Think about it. Where are you on your spiritual journey? It's given the assumption you assume they're on one, right? You're just asking them where they are. Well, I'm not even on one. Okay, well, let's start there. Or, well, maybe I'm, I'm doubting. You can start conversations. You know, we think of the questions we were maybe taught in Sunday school where you say, if you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? If God was to ask you why should he let you into heaven, what would you say? And the best question you can ask somebody, a friend who you're talking with, how can I pray for you today? Let people know that you're there, that you care. Reach out and talk to them. Show them some love. And we see here, Philip comes and just says, how do you, do you understand what you're saying? And how can I, unless someone guides me? And we see here, he turns around, and in verse 3, it says, how can I, he said, unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage they were reading, if you hope you're looking at this. So here he is. Philip starts a conversation ask a question, gets involved into a conversation, and then so he's reading, says, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is this prophet saying this about, himself or someone else? Man, we know as believers what this verse is about. And so what Philip does is he begins to take that verse right where he's at, and Philip proceeds to tell him with the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. He took him where he was and took him to Jesus. The best thing you can do when you're talking to somebody is get him to Jesus as fast as you can. Well, Pastor, I don't even know where to begin. Start with where they are. How's your day going? Where are you on your spiritual journey? How can I pray for you? Hear their needs and then take them to Jesus. Show them Jesus. And that's what Philip did. He sits there and begins to share out God's word with him, showing him what it is. And we see this in Isaiah 53, 7, 8. He's probably been reading all of this passage. He's going through these scrolls. He had probably had just finished this where he said, you know, he's talking about it was led to a sheep to a slaughter before his shearers. We know that he's talking about Jesus. And he probably had just finished reading before that where it says he was pierced because of our rebellion crushed because of our iniquities, punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep and have turned to our own way. The Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. So here, this Ethiopian is reading this scroll of Isaiah, and he's talking about Jesus who's there. He's now taking this Old Testament, and he's like, Philip is able to say, that's Jesus. 
He was prophesied, he was foretold, he came, he lived, he died, and he's coming again. Tell people about the gospel. Show them. He sits there and tells him and walks him through the gospel presentation, showing him what the love of Christ is. Don't get bogged down in political garbage. The Bible has a lot of wonderful things to say and teaches us great things, but the thing that people need to hear the most is they need Jesus. Instead of trying to convert them to your political opinion, convert them to Jesus. Show them Jesus. You know, if the church got more busy about the gospel and people got saved, we wouldn't have to worry about all the political arguing going on because people would be focused on Jesus. We need to get people back to his word. We need to get people understanding the importance of the gospel, going out and reaching people for Christ. Now, what's so cool is they go through this and they're traveling down the road and after he's shared the gospel with him as they travel down in verse 36, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, there is water. What would keep me from being baptized? What's going to stop me? Now you figure, he's just come from Jerusalem. He's been worshiping, and he's been there going through, and he got probably up there, and now because he's Ethiopian, because he's a eunuch, he's not able to go into the temple. He's not able to be a part of their worship and all their uh, rituals, and he's probably been discouraged. He came seeking truth, couldn't get involved with it, so now he's coming out, and now he's like, well, what's, am I not allowed to be baptized? What's keeping me? But look at what he said. He goes, so he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and baptized him. Now, for us Baptists, what do we see here? They went, what? Down into the water. He didn't spray some water on his forehead, okay? And then it says, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. So we see baptism by immersion. They went down into the water, came up out of the water. What is so great is when we come to know Christ, we're saved, the Holy Spirit comes in us, but we should follow in believers' baptism. And so what we see here is they didn't stop, he sees the water, he comes out, he gets baptized. Now, what is so cool in verse 20, 39, for those of you who are sci-fi people, I love this verse, and I know sci-fi is just, it's fiction, but think about this, they got the first teleportation going on in the Bible, okay? We see here it says, so he ordered the chariot to stop and Philip and the eunuch went down in the water and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. He's out of there. Disappeared. Gone. Okay. Takes him away and then said, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. Now, if you were hanging out with somebody and he just baptized you, you open your eyes and he's gone, you'd probably freak out, wouldn't you? But what here he does, he just says, goes, hey, he's not here. He doesn't freak out. He just starts rejoicing because what happened? He's saved. He's excited. He's got the Holy Spirit. He's saved. He knows Jesus. And now he's going to go back to his country. But we see here, Philip's, boom, he's out of there. And then verse 40, Philip appeared and Antios, and was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. I don't know how God did it, but the Bible says he was there, then he's not there, then he's somewhere else. To me, that's pretty cool. I, I love science fiction, but this isn't science fiction. This is Jesus. He said, you were here, you're not, you're there. Pretty cool. You know, I'm sorry, I got to geek out on that. That's just fun stuff for me. But we see here what the Samaritan did. Now he's saved. What does he do? He's going to go back to his people. Now, remember, he's an official in the queen's court. And he goes back and he tells people about Jesus. He goes to the ends of the earth. What were we supposed to do? Go to Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. God made a divine appointment to take this Philip to meet one guy, to share the gospel with him, tell him about Jesus. He gets saved baptizes him, then he goes back and he tells the people. We know that through position, God puts us where we need to be. 
We need to look at that. Maybe that's your home. You know, if we started looking at where we, we are as a divine appointment, you can say, well, I don't like where I live. Well, God brought you there for a reason. I don't like where I work. Have you looked at your job as a mission field? How many people you work with need Jesus? Okay. I work with people who need Jesus. I work, people come to church, they need Jesus. Okay. We need to realize where we are is where God has us. If he doesn't want you there, he'll show you. But quit looking, well, I can't talk to my neighbor. I don't like them. They need Jesus. Your coworker needs Jesus. Your friends need Jesus. Get out and find those divine appointments. A few weeks ago, God gave me a divine appointment to encourage me. Went shopping on a Sunday afternoon. Yes, I'm a pastor. I know I probably shouldn't go shopping on a Sunday, but I did. Needed some new clothes. And I went into a, the DXL store and struck up this conversation with the salesman. And what was amazing is he was a believer, and I started sharing with him that it was a pastor and a church, and he started lighting up and getting a smile. He goes, man... I miss church. I really wish I could be in church today. And we just started this conversation. And I think, is it two hours? Two hours. Darlene and I were there just talking to this guy, sharing with him, loving on him, encouraging him. He was encouraging me, prayed for him. The guy was crying. The store is already supposed to have been closed. We're still there after closing. And what's amazing is not another person came in the store for two hours. Now I'm thinking... You know, they're probably wishing more people came in. But here, God had positioned me into a place to strike up a conversation with somebody and encourage them and love on them and tell him it's okay. And I told him, can I pray with you? And I prayed with him, and he had tears running down his eyes. Now, I don't say that, say, well, look, at, uh, I'm so bad. Look for those opportunities. You never know the delivery person that brings your food to your door because you're afraid to go out, tell them God bless them. How can I pray for you? When you're sitting in the waiting room at the doctor's office, strike up a conversation with somebody. Tell the cashier you appreciate him, that God loves you. You know, I love it. There's a store I go to quite frequently and they check you as you're leaving, going out. And there's always this one person there who's checking off the receipts. Just have, you can see a smile through the mask. You can just see it in her eyes. And I always tell her, be blessed. And she goes, oh, you be blessed too. I said, no, you be blessed more than me. And just talk up with them. Encourage people and listen. But we got to be close and then proclaim. Share the gospel with you every opportunity you can. Remember, Philip was called out of a place that was doing great to go to a desolate place to reach one person. And I think about that. You know, I look at other churches and pastors do this. We look, when, a lot of times when pastors get together, they say, well, how are things going? That's Q code for how many you run and how big's your church. I see here in the scripture, God took a pastor or a minister from a place that was doing great, put him in a place just to reach one. He didn't complain. He reached the one. So maybe in your life you say, well, I've not reached anybody. Can you reach one? Just one. Just imagine if everybody in here, look around. It's a pretty good crowd today. If every one of you reached one person for Jesus before the end of the year, just one. And then next year, one more. We could go out. Don't be afraid to sit there and say, well, I can't reach hundreds, Pastor. I can't reach tens. I'm just asking you to reach one. Who's your one? Think about who it is you can reach this year. The holidays are coming. Encourage them to come to church. We're going to have a trunk or treat and thing. Maybe they have kids. Tell them, hey, come up, bring your kids, get some candy. But we're going to give them a gospel track. We're going to invite them to church. Christmas is coming. Hey, we're still going to have a Christmas service. I don't care what any of the thing in the government says. We're going to have a Christmas service. Amen? And encourage people to come out. Love on them. Build bridges. Get close to them. Pour into their life. Don't give up. But you can't do any of this if you're not saved. 
Have you come to a point? If I was asked you the questions, where are you on your spiritual journey? Where are you on your faith journey? Have you begun it? Have you taken a break from it? Maybe just need to be encouraged to get back on the path. Talk to people. Maybe if I was to ask you, if you were to die tonight, where would you be? How would you answer it? If you know you're a believer, you need to express that and tell people, I'm going to heaven because of Jesus. Talk to your friends, ask them those questions. Ask them where are they. Ask them how you can pray for them. It's through a relationship with Christ. I look forward to the day that we'll all be in heaven. But as a pastor, the thing that concerns me is maybe not everybody that was a part of the church I'll see in heaven. I don't know. Only you know for sure if you're saved. Only you know for sure if you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Are you walking the path? If God said, I need you to go tell somebody, are you going to say, not now? You know, but he says, go. Are you going? You say, well, he hasn't told me that yet. I think I already read it. God said it. Jesus said it. Go into all the world. We've already been told to go. What are you waiting on? Because one day we're going to be in heaven, those of us that know Jesus. And it's going to be a glorious day. We're going to see Jesus. We're going to see our family and friends. And, you know, I say, well, I can't wait to see aunt so-and-so or my husband this. And, you know, that's all well and good and we'll have all eternity. But the one we want to see most is Jesus. You know, I can sit there and think of all the people in the Bible I'd like to, I want to have a conversation with at some point in eternity. But I want to get, where's the line to Jesus first? Let me go see him, because that's why I'm there. Because of what he did, not what I did. Do you know for sure you're going? That glorious day when we're going to stand before God and hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. I look forward to that day. Are you telling your friends and family? Do they know for sure that they're going? Have you asked them? grandparents. You say, your job's not over yet. You say, well, your kids are out of the house, and maybe you have some regrets and wish you would have done more to tell your children about Jesus. Talk to them grandkids. Love on them. Tell them about Jesus. Pray for them. Don't be afraid to share the gospel. In the coming weeks, we're going to see a lot of people sharing Hatred, arguing over who's right and who's wrong. The Bible's right. Everything else doesn't matter. We're going to stand before God with, to see Jesus. How many are we going to take with him? It's not about anything else. It's about Jesus. I look forward to that day. I hope you're going to be there one day with me. Would you stand with me as we pray? Lord, I just thank you so much for your love, your mercy, and your grace. I thank you that you built bridges for us to come to know Christ. I thank you that you sent people into our lives. Maybe each one of us here can think about that person that reached out to us, got close to us, talked to us, encouraged us, prayed with us, prayed for us. Lord, I pray that we begin to realize that we're called to go. Maybe it's to go home today and tell our family about Jesus. Maybe it's to go and tell our co-workers about Jesus. Maybe it's to go and tell neighbors and friends or those inter divine intersections with people that we just come across through the day. Help people to see Jesus in us. But Lord, if there's anyone watching today at home or sitting in this place today or standing here today and they don't know for sure where they're going to go when they come into eternity, I pray that today they realize they can meet Jesus through asking for forgiveness of sins. I pray as we prepare for the glorious day of knowing you and worshiping you and celebrating you that you will help us 
Give us the strength to be bold in our witness, to preach the gospel, to tell people about Jesus, to not be afraid. We thank you now. I pray you use this time of decision for the people to come maybe and pray at the altar for that loved one that they need to get closer to and tell about Jesus, to pray for that neighbor, to pray for somebody, to just think about how can we go into all the world. We can't go into the world until we're willing to start where we're at. So give us that strength, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing. Amen. Before we sing our last song, Glorious Day, I just kind of felt it oppressed upon my heart to add in a little extra something, if that's all right with you, Pastor. Um, we're not going to have any words on the screen for it. I'd just love for you to listen to the words of this song. It just talks about those verses that we heard in Isaiah about Jesus. By his wounds we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. We are healed by your sacrifice in the life that you gave. We are healed for you paid the price. By your grace we are saved, we are saved. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds. By his wounds we are healed. We are healed by your sacrifice in the life that you gave. We are healed for you paid the price by your grace. We we are saved, we are saved. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Y'all may be seated. We're going to sing one more song of closing. Glorious day. One day when heaven was filled with His praises One day when sin was as black as could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin Dwelt among men, my example is He The Word became flesh and the light shined among us, His glory revealed. Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He carried my sins far away. Rising, He justified freely forever. One day, He's coming, O oh, glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain One day they nailed him to die on a tree 
Suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. The hands that healed nations stretched out on a tree, and He took the nails for me, living He loved me, dying He saved me, buried He carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day one day the grave could conceal him no longer one day the stone rolled away from the door then he arose over death he had conquered now is ascended my lord evermore and death could not hold him the grave could not keep him from rising again, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, and one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. trumpet will sound for his coming one day the skies with his glories will shine wonderful day my beloved one bringing my savior jesus is mine living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever and one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day Amen. Um, today, as you know, is, is Pastor Appreciation Day. I appreciate the pastor come up here and Darlene, please. The Sorry. As part part of the part of the church is our devotion to our pastor as well as our God and our Lord. These, these two right here are amazing people of God. They, they love him. They love on us. They do what they can to um, take care of us. He sacrifices a lot, both of them do, for us. They, you know, they, they do a lot that we don't see behind the scenes. You know, like he says, he's done everything a pastor should not have to do, in other words. Um, but I'm, part of the, I want to give this to you guys. We love you guys. Um, sometime this week or this month, is the whole month is Pastor Appreciation Month, so reach out to them. Most of all, pray for them because they're a constant battle. The, the, the devil... Satan's trying to do everything he can to stop this church from doing what it's doing. We're doing something right because Amen. God is in control. Amen. So sometime this week, reach out to them, take them out to dinner, send them love cards, you know, do something for them because they, they sacrifice a lot for us and they don't complain about it. They just love God. They do what God tells them to do and 
that's how we should be us our, our, ourselves. So I'm going to pray us out. Uh, if you want to come by and say hi to them, I guess we can do it um, <laughs> dis distancely. But um, and it's good to see Judy and Nelson here today. They're they're here today. It was good to see them, and good to see people out in the crowd. Let me pray us out. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for our lives. I just pray your uh, blessing on our pastor and his wife. Take care of them. Um, they need they need protection. And protect the church as well. Be with us as we go our way. Keep us safe. I thank you for the message he's brought our way. I thank you for Aaron and Lexi. Take care of them as well. And I thank you for your love. In your name I pray. Amen. God bless. Go in God peace, bless. everybody.